Staffio Now is presented by Northwest Financial Advisors, where our world revolves around you. This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded interviews with former senior U.S. intelligence officers and those who write about them. Today we have a real treat. The author is widely published and well known to us all. He has strongly expressed views in both his new book and this interview, but they are well documented. While AFIO does not necessarily endorse all of his views, we strongly believe that our members and the public deserve to be better informed, whether or not they agree with all of his conclusions. All the information has been published previously, and anything classified has gone through the appropriate declassification process. I'm privileged today to have joining me someone who's very, very knowledgeable in this area. He's a friend and colleague by the name of John Kotraki. John is a retired senior FBI officer with a lot of field time. He also did service at the NSC, the DNI, and DOD. He was a vice president at CACI, and he is now a professor at uh, the Institute of World Politics. John, welcome back to AFIO Now. Thanks, Jim. And thanks to James Bamford, our guest for the day, and hopefully for another day after this, as we have an extraordinary amount of material to cover. James, as most of our viewership will know, is the Dean of Intelligence Journalism when it comes to SIGINT and our own National Security Agency. Having written three books, all of them New York Times bestsellers, Body of Secrets, Puzzle Palace, and The Shadow Factory. Jim's also an Emmy-nominated award winner for his documentary on NSA after 9-11. Additionally, Jim's also the National Magazine Award winner for reporting for his writing on the war in Iraq. James, Jim, friend to AFIO since 1982 and a member, welcome to AFIO Now. Well, thanks, John. Great to be here. And thanks, Jim, for, for having me on. I've, uh, like you just said, I've been a member since uh, 82, which uh, dates me quite a bit. But uh, I've always enjoyed meeting the people that uh, a lot of the people that are, are far more knowledgeable than I am about the intelligence community. So uh, which is why I've always been a member and why I've always enjoyed coming to the meetings. Thanks, Jim. And before we get started, and Jim and I had this conversation uh, off camera before we started, a point of personal privilege. So Jim and I have actually crossed paths professionally on a number of occasions over the last 40 plus years, which I'm somewhat loath to admit. Uh, and Jim had been a bit of a thorn in my side back in 1989. I was the case agent for the iceberg major case at FBI, which examined the espionage of nine U.S. soldiers, starting with Clyde Conrad and Zoltan Zabo, and going down to a man named Rod Ramsey down in Tampa, Florida. And we had a meeting at headquarters when we were told to go to a TV because a reporter for ABC was breaking news on contact with our subject, Rod Ramsey, and that reporter was Jim Bamford. So... He has been in and around my casework for the last 40 plus years. And for that, I applaud him and his extraordinary work with regard to investigative journalism. But we've got some scores to settle and maybe we'll do some of that today and some of it later. So, Jim, again, congratulations on extraordinary work back then and really on an exceptional book here in, in Spy Fail. Well, thanks, John. I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, I never realized you were on the other side of the looking glass there. Uh, while I was doing these stories, uh, fascinating spy stories. But um, yeah, uh, the Clyde Conrad was one I was uh, especially interested in. And I uh, went to Vienna, Austria, looking for his spy master, Zoltan Zabo. And at one point, uh, I found where he was living and I decided to follow him one day in a car. Um, not realizing that the Austrian secret police were also following him. So it was almost like a conga line. As I was following him, the Austrian secret police were following me, and they suspected I was a Hungarian assassin about to 
to kill Zabo. So they pulled me over, arrested me, and took me in, and then they finally figured out I was a journalist and let me go. So I've had a lot of adventures uh, also on some of the same cases that uh, we both worked on. Which I guess then just begs the question, Jim, given your extraordinary acclaim for, for your trilogy on NSA and SIGINT, in Spy Fail here, you really you take a clear you make a clear departure and swerve into the darkest corner of U.S. intelligence, which is, for the most part, U.S. counterintelligence and human. So for our listenership and our membership and our viewership, can you fill us in a little bit on, on what made you decide to take this turn, I guess, in 2016 when you first had the idea for the book? Yeah, sure. I've. Uh... You know, as we just mentioned, I've been writing about intelligence for a very long time. Um, uh, when I started out, nobody had really written about the technical side of intelligence, so that's why I decided to, to do NSA. I always thought it was a fascinating agency, and nobody had written about it, so uh, I focused on that. But in doing some of these other uh, stories that I worked on for uh, ABC, for example, uh, Zabo and uh, a number of other stories, uh, the, um, uh, for example, I, uh, uh, Robert Hansen, uh, who everybody knows, uh, uh, was a, became a spy for, for Russia, um, while he was working at the FBI. I had known, uh, Hansen for, for years. He uh, was actually at my wedding. Uh, we had, uh, gone out numerous times for lunches and so forth. Um, so that really got me thinking about uh, the human side here. I'd known this uh, guy, uh, Robert Hansen, for all these years, and I write about intelligence, and I never knew that he was a, a, a Russian spy that whole time. So um, so that and other things, uh, dealing with Zabo and, and a lot of other cases, I thought, you know, it'd be interesting to look at the the counterintelligence side, the spy catching side of the business, rather than just uh, uh, you know satellites and uh, big uh, uh, listening devices and so forth, uh, satellite dishes and so forth. So that's one of the reasons, and I it was fascinating because uh, rather than dealing with technology uh, and and having to. Uh, do a lot of homework on on how signals are transmitted from one place to another. I, I was dealing with human beings and and the uh, uh, how human beings basically work as opposed to how satellites work. And a theme, if not a principal theme, certainly a secondary theme you introduce in the book, which we are familiar with in the human and counterintelligence side, is, is a principle you introduce, I think, very deftly throughout the book, but particularly in chapter 30, uh, 29, which is the whole notion of human-enabled SIGINT, which is a bridge a lot of our viewership and membership don't have a real grasp of, but those at the CIA, the FBI, and NSA have a unique and intimate grasp of because, as you point out in the book, in some cases, it's the essential element to making the SIGINT piece work. Right. So can you, can you expand on that a little bit as to was the human enabled SIGINT, that is the bridge between human and SIGINT, more considerable than you thought it would be or about what you thought it would be based on your previous research into NSA and SIGINT? No, I hadn't really come across it too much. I'd focus mostly on NSA and technology and how it's done and and the actual people at NSA, uh, their uh, work and how they do it and so forth. So I hadn't really seen that uh, nexus uh, before. So that was very fascinating in writing this book, where I was able to show how, um, you know, this NSA does uh, most of its work remotely. I mean, it has satellites, it has all kinds of listening posts, and uh, as far as China goes, in, in uh, Japan and Okinawa and South Korea and so forth. And so it's all sort of remote listening, um, which is fine if you're interested mostly in international communications and so forth. Uh, uh, satellites are very good for that. However, uh, you know, if you want to listen to what's going on inside the city or within the country, uh, uh, a lot of times it's much better to be able to get access to the local communications links. And that's where the 
uh, F, uh, the, that's where the uh, the CIA uh, comes in because the CIA people are on the ground, both CIA officers and their sub agents that, that are working for them. That's where that nexus comes together. The the CIA officer can get his sub agent or uh, recruit somebody to go into the local telecommunications center, uh, usually bribing with money or whatever, and and um, uh, you know, basically ask the person, here's a router. If you can go in there and pull out the router that's in there and put this router, this identical router in there, it'd take you five minutes and, you know, get $50,000 or whatever. Um, and once that's in there, then all of a sudden the NSA has now access to the information because it's a, obviously a bugged router that's uh, designed to filter a lot of the conversations uh, to a satellite or whatever for NSA to pick up. So that's how the two work together a lot. And I thought it was a really great way to um, put the two together, get the human and the technical side and how they have to work together um, in, in a lot of uh, important situations. Yeah. And for me, it, it was... I wouldn't say an eye opener. In fact, going back to our, our cross paths 40 years ago, uh, the Conrad Zabo case, as you know, was originally a war plan, a paper case. And we had pursued it for years, not months, but years as a paper case. And then came the day we were down in Tampa interviewing Rod Ramsey, and he starts to describe tape, <clears throat> which we had never heard of in the old days for our younger viewers. All the crypto was done on tape. It wasn't done digitally. It was actually done on tape. And he was describing a world to us we had no idea of. We had examined his full record, and he had no access, no seeming access to crypto of any kind to include the ComSec custodian and the tape held at the 8th Infantry Division. And so it made no sense to us. We were almost ready to dismiss it. Embrace yourself, Jim. Here comes a huge compliment for you from the NSA, if you can believe it. Uh but I called NSA out of an abundance of diligence, and I said, look, we got somebody all of a sudden taking a hard left turn on us here, and he's talking about access to crypto materials. And the NSA almost gave us the back of their hand. They said, well, look, we keep great records, which they do, and we've reviewed all the ComSec holdings for VCOR and 8th ID in Bad Kreuznach, Germany, and it's this just doesn't make any sense to us. However, out of an abundance of caution, here are seven questions you can ask your subject. There is no way he can guess at the right answers. He either knows them or he doesn't know them. Ask him the seven questions. Fax back the old Stu 2 days so on old Stu 2 hooked up to a fax machine. Fax back the answers, and then we'll know if he's just a fabricator or if there's anything to this. So we ask Rod the seven questions. He promptly gives us seven answers, but he's pretty good, as you are aware, Jim, at you know, being facile with with his relationships and, and the spoken word. So we send him back thinking he's just making up as he goes along. NSA calls back 45 minutes later and says, we have a plane leaving for Germany tomorrow. We've got 10 copy machines on there and 50,000 pages of copy paper. You can go with us or you can go without you, or you can turn down the opportunity to travel with us, but we're going regardless. And so immediately the human counterintelligence, counterespionage case became a big SIGINT case for us. And I knew nothing about SIGINT or NSA at the time. And so an NSA senior, what the, we used to call in the old days, the SOIC, the senior officer in the intelligence community at NSA turned to me very, very quietly said, if you know nothing about what we do, there's a great book out, but don't tell anybody I told you to read. It's called The Puzzle Palace. It'll catch up on what we do and how we do business out here. And I strongly recommend it to you. <laughs> So in 89, I had a forced feeding on NSA, and it was all courtesy of your fabulous book, The Puzzle Palace, the first in your trilogy. So again, causing paths, more importantly for our audience here, and I'll ask you to pick up on that in a bit, is establishing that the SIGINT community and the human communities do not reside in silos wherein there is no interaction among or between the two. There's actually quite a bit of interaction, not only here in the United States, but as you point out in your book, uh, globally uh, to the benefit and yours to the benefit of the whole U.S. national security approach. So, so I appreciate that uh, both 30 plus years on and, and currently. 
Well, thanks for the compliment, John. I really uh, had no idea that uh, that I had a uh, a friend in the business there uh, 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 suggesting my book to people, but uh, I'm glad uh, glad it worked out. And and uh, yeah, I was uh, very happy to find how easy it is for these agencies to work together sometimes and how important it is for them to work together. Uh, having focused on NSA, I never thought how uh, important it was to also get a human human being on the ground also involved in order to get that satellite the information it needs. So yeah, it's a, it was a great learning experience for me. So thanks, Jim. Uh, with that as a foundation for our, our membership, our viewership and, and our listenership in some cases. Let me turn to the book now. Fascinating opening. You're you're an incredible scene setter. The detail and, and the context and the background you provide in every one of your books. There's this intriguing book structure to your book and then the chapters that support it uh, are just rich in detail. And And you begin by telling us, your reader, this covers the period from 2016 to 2022. And he introduced us to a man by the name of Michael Linton at Sony Pictures. But that almost immediately takes the old hands in us, the old Soviet hands in us, almost immediately back through a man by the name of Benjamin Bloomberg and Lechem, which used to be the old commercially facing acquisition arm of the Mossad back in Israel, back to the mid 60s. For those of us you know, wet our beak on the Soviets and the Warsaw Pact intelligence agencies. We're right back into the mid sixties with Christine Keeler and her, apparently her nightlife uh, compatriot, uh, Mandy Rice Davies and the perfume affair, which then introduces us to Benjamin Bloomberg because Mandy Rice Davies apparently having been kind of brought up short by the arrest of Profumo and the celebrity and then the notoriety and then the notoriousness of Christine Keeler leaves London and migrates to Israel. And if I could, if I could ask you to pick up the story there, which then will bring us with a narrative thread all the way through your book up to where we are currently, and then we'll pick up the story there. Sure. Uh, the reason I got into that was because um, I focused a great deal on uh, Arnon Milchan. He's a really famous producer in Hollywood. Uh, and there were a lot of uh, uh, rumors uh, about him being connected to Israeli intelligence. Uh, he's won the Academy Award Best Picture twice. Uh, he has $4 billion in the bank. He's very famous. So I, uh, in looking at him, um, he, he became a major character for, for me in terms of a number of chapters. I had to look, although I was focused on 2016 to 2022, um, and I talk about those events, I had to go back to his early days, uh, how he got into the spying business for Israel. And that took me back actually to the mid 60s where he had just, uh, his father had died. He was in his 20s. His father had died. He left him this big business, uh, international business, um, uh, uh, some farming kind of a business, uh, uh, agricultural business. And he um, used to go to that uh, restaurant that was run by Mandy Rice Davis. And he was a good friend of Mandy Rice Davis. So while he was there, um, he uh, got introduced to a number of people in the Israeli government. And from that moment on, he uh, he was, you know, determined to uh, to basically become a spy. So he got introduced to uh, Bloomberg, uh, uh, Benjamin Bloomberg. Bloomberg recruited him into LACM, the, uh, the secret intelligence organization in Israel that focuses on, on uh, nuclear weapons. And so from the mid 60s on, uh, uh, Milchan had been uh, a, a member of, of, of Lockham and he became a nuclear spy. So tracing him back from the mid 60s to, you know, 2016 and whatever, uh, it, it was really fascinating uh, because he was involved in so many different activities from becoming an arms dealer for apartheid South Africa, 
on behalf of uh, Israel, largely, uh, to um, uh, becoming the top propagandist for uh, uh, the apartheid government, pushing apartheid uh, around the world uh, uh, secretly, basically, through propaganda. And eventually ends up in the U.S. Um, and he wants to become a, a a producer, which was basically a cover for um, his work as a as a Israeli spy, a nuclear spy. So he set up a front company outside of Los Angeles, run by an, an American that he had recruited. And the whole idea was uh, through this front company, Israel would get materials that they can't get otherwise through the Pentagon and so forth. It was just a front company to get material for for uh, Israel. And one of the key things they wanted were Krytons, since Israel was building nuclear weapons and Krytons were key elements. Uh, they were the basically the triggers to, to uh, set off uh, nuclear weapons. So Milchin, at the same time he's producing uh, movies with Robert De Niro and so forth, very famous movies, he's also working secretly uh, for Israel, uh, trying to get them Krytons through his front company. And and um, <clears throat> eventually his sub-agent, uh, uh, who was an American um, and knew all about that, he was trying to get him the Krytons, was arrested. And uh, he faced 105 years in prison. He escaped, went to uh, uh, Spain, spent 16 years there, all this time, Nobody's going after Milchin. I mean, Milchin's making billions of dollars, making money, and his poor sub-agent there, uh, um, a guy named Smith, uh, um, had to disappear and hide out and, and then was eventually caught and went to prison. But again, through all this, nothing ever happened to Milchin. So that was fascinating to me <clears throat> to look at Milchin and his background, how he got to be where he was, and why uh, nobody went after him. Apparently, I mean, looking into this very closely, the FBI uh, agents uh, really did want to go after him. Um, but uh, because Israel was involved at the high levels, White House or whatever, um, the, the um, order went out that uh, he wasn't going to be touched. And so uh, he hasn't been touched yet. Um, and that gets into... <laughs> more detail much later on where he gets involved with uh, criminal activity with uh, with uh, uh, Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu. So that's another chapter in the book that comes in later on. But in order to get there, um, I had to go back to the beginning where how Milchin actually got into the whole business in the first place. Right. So Milchin is somebody we encounter substantially and, and for the first time from the Bureau's perspective. Uh, in 1982, 83, 84, and then ultimately 85, as you said, he sets up a Milko Front Company in Huntington Beach, California, which then fronts for heli trading over in Israel. And the San Diego office and the Los Angeles office of the FBI get involved back then as an FBI investigation along with commerce because these Krytron triggers that you refer to are actually commercially available with heavy restrictions on end user requirements for certificates and export controls. Um, and the man you're referring to is Michael Kelly Smith and his, and his bride who eventually escape rather than face a trial. And like you said, perhaps as many as 105 years in, in prison. So it's at that point we leave Milchan for a while because it's undetermined, at least from the Bureau's perspective, whether or not he was an officer of Mossad or an agent working at the direction of Mossad. But then we come in contact with really one of the more colorful characters in all of human and counterintelligence and counterespionage, and that's Rafi Aitan, who at this point in 1985 has been the head of LACAM since 1981. Then Bloomberg unceremoniously is dumped from his job in 1981. And Rafi Aitan, the Mossad case officer who helped in the extraction of Eichmann back in the 60s, has now taken over as the head of Lechem, and he gets involved on the East Coast and the West Coast here in the United States, getting involved in the Smith case on the West Coast, while at the same time, and I'll ask you to pick up for our audience here, Jim, while at the same time, Meeting at noontime 
with Pollard here on the East Coast is Pollard's taking materials out of DIA to a safe house up in Northwest D.C., where they are back in the days of paper, making paper copies of materials that Pollard's taking out of DIA and then providing to the Israelis and then bringing the materials back to DIA to put it back in the safe before the end of the business day. So if I could, I'm going to ask you to pick up now on Rafi Aitan, who, like I said, is a, is a colorful character. I think he's only passed away like three or four years ago um, and has a long, long history, not only in Israel, but around the world and in particular here in the United States. And, and as I recall from my original casework, we actually see Rafi Aitan come with arguably one of the more impressive visits by an intelligence cadre ever in the history of counterintelligence in September, September 10th or so of 1968, when he and the future head of Shin Bet and Lekham representative here in the United States and the chief of station here in the United States all make a visit out to a little town called Apollo, Pennsylvania, to visit a company called Numec back in 1968. So if I could, if I could ask you to pick up on one, the person, the personality of Rafi Aitan, and then take us back again to the 60s and Israeli targeting of the Numec company in Apollo, Pennsylvania, and how that's a part of the larger picture of acquisition of parts necessary to a nuclear weapons program, having addressed the Kryton triggers piece in the early to mid 80s, and now the fissile material piece from the mid to late 60s. Well, Rafi Tom was uh, really fascinating to me. Uh, I came across him uh, in the book for the first time when um, I was looking at the plant in Apollo, Pennsylvania, where it was actually a private company. Uh, the government allowed this private company to operate as a, a nuclear processing facility. So they would process plutonium and highly enriched uh, uranium there. And there were a lot of connections between the owner of that company and the Israeli government. Uh, so he became very suspicious uh, to the FBI. They began looking into him. And um, because they had a report from the CIA station chief in, in Israel that the highly enriched uranium, they were getting sort of samples of it. They were, it, it would some of it would escape from the plant in Demona, uh, Demona and uh, they would be able to get a little pieces of samples of it, and they analyzed it, and they realized it came from uh, a plant in Georgia, um, a processing plant in Georgia. So the only plant that that company did business with was the company uh, Numec in uh, in, in uh, Pennsylvania, follow Pennsylvania. So there there was this direct link between the uh, highly enriched uranium. In um, Demona, Israel's nuclear uh, uh, plant uh, for making nuclear weapons, and the uh, the company in in uh, Pennsylvania, Numic. So <clears throat> it became very uh, a big target for the FBI to look into this. And uh, at one point, uh, these people from Israel showed up at this little plant in Follow uh, Pennsylvania. And we're meeting the owner and getting a tour and so forth. And it, uh, they later checked and who see who these people were. And one of them was Rafi Itan, a uh, senior member of the, uh, at the time, Mossad. Uh, and so it was obvious that, that uh, this plant was uh, secretly supplying Israel with the highly enriched uranium it needed. And... Um, so uh, once again, there was never any arrest made, even though uh, there was uh, uh, obviously uh, grounds for arrest uh, based on all the evidence that that was there. Uh, Richard Helms uh, uh, was the first one to tell the FBI about the indication of of, uh, of a link to to Demona and asked the FBI to to start looking into it. And the science uh, S and T group at the CIA said definitely there's a uh, link here, but basically got up to the White House and and uh, um, again because Israel was involved, they didn't want anything done. So basically, that was the beginning of my uh, uh, introduction of uh, of Rafi Itan. Um, he comes in later on because uh, 
Um, he eventually uh, takes over Lockham from uh, Benjamin uh, Bloomberg. And when he is in, in Lockham, um, uh, Pollard is working for him, uh, stealing secrets from the Navy, for example. And so there, uh, I write about some fascinating meetings between Pollard and uh, Rafi Itan. At one point, he's in a hospital, in uh, Rafi Itan's in a hospital in Israel. He's having an eye operation, and um, he gets a visit from from Pollard, who goes over and meets him. And Pollard is getting very scared because Smith, who is the sub agent of, of Milchin, was uh, subject to arrest. He, he was so Pollard was getting very nervous. He goes over and sees Rafi Itan, and they they get into a really big argument right there in the hot hospital room. Um, Pollard's demanding that he get a escape plan in case something happens, and Rafi Tan sort of brushing him off, saying, nothing's going to happen. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And so Pollard gets very angry, and then he goes back to the U.S., and um, at one point, uh, Rafi Tan says to him, look, you've got a 10-year contract with us, so just keep doing it. And so uh, Pollard goes back. He eventually gets arrested. So after Pollard gets arrested, that's sort of the end of uh, or close to the end of Lockham because uh, it was such a, a disaster uh, turning out to be, uh, the, you know, the arrest of Pollard and the exposure of uh, of Lockham and so forth. So that was sort of the end of Rafi Itan and the uh, end of, uh, of Lockham. Um, but Rafi Itan uh, uh, also dealt with uh, Milchin uh, because Milchin was part of him also. Right. And and going back again for our listenership and our viewership here, um, in fact, Pollard's fears were not misplaced, right? The, the the Richard Kelly Smith piece was playing out on the front page of the Los Angeles Times in the spring and in the summer of 85. So, so it wasn't something he had heard via the rumor mill. It was something he was acutely aware of. The meeting you described between him and Rafi Atan in 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 Israel is just, it's riveting for me, having been in the San Diego office at that time. Um, and then, of course, Richard Kelly Smith and his wife take off. They're on the lam for almost 20 years, 18 years or so. And then, I guess, applying for a change of their social security status, <laughs> they wind up they wind up coming up on the system, which are now, you know, thanks, I guess, to Al Gore, Paper systems are becoming digitized in the U.S. government and their names pop up and there's a issue or a warrant issued for their arrest. And that brings them back in the United States at the beginning of the 21st century uh, to face trial. And it kind of brings that whole chapter to an end. But, of course, as you say, by this point, that is since by 1986, Lakham is now shut down. The Israelis have shut down Lakham. It's been in existence since 1957 having turned its sights globally to the commercial acquisition of elements necessary to its nuclear weapons program. But by 1986, with the arrest of Pollard in a pretty dramatic scene up on Van Ness Avenue here, as he's trying to get into the embassy and they're disavowing any knowledge of him, and he does his full 30 uh, based on his arrest in November of 85, and then the escape of Smith, the whole Lechem piece comes to an end as I understand it, unless you're aware of a reincarnation of Lechem under a different, with a different letterhead on its, on its stationery, I'm not aware of, of how it's been reconstituted, if at all. No, it, uh, it pretty much uh, got absorbed into uh, Mossad. Um, and that was the end of Lechem. But just to get back for a minute, Rafi Itan, what was really fascinating was that uh, Pollard, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Atan never gave him an, an escape plan. So when uh, he he uh, became under suspicion and he was being followed every day by a conga line of uh, FBI cars, FBI agents, he uh, wanted a plan and escape. And the escape was to go to the uh, embassy, declare that he's Jewish and that uh, he demands to be returned to Israel. And so that was his plan. That was how he was going to escape uh, the U.S. and escape being uh, arrested. <clears throat> so he did that. He and his wife uh, and their cat, uh, they drove to the uh, embassy and uh, he went on a rather circuitous route as he's being followed by all these FBI agents. 
And then at the last minute, there's a car turning into the Israeli embassy. And so he falls right right in after it, uh, just before the gate closes. So he finally gets inside the embassy and he gets out and says, you know, I'm Jewish, I'm uh, law of return, you know, I want to go to Israel. Uh, uh, the FBI is after, after me at that point, all the cars are outside the embassy. And so they, the embassy officials don't know what to do. So they call up Rafi Eitan in, in, uh, in Israel and say, hey, we got a guy here, you know, he, he apparently is uh, one of your spies. He wants to, us to protect him from the FBI, send him back to Israel and so forth. What should we do? And Eitan says, throw him out. <laughs> and so uh, Pollard never forgave him for that. Uh, and Rafi Eitan later said, look, I had no choice. What was I going to do? Um, create an international incident by uh, uh, keeping Pollard in there. So um, he, he had to go. And so Pollard is screaming and then he gets back in his car and slowly drives out. And as soon as he gets past the gate, he gets the handcuffs put on him. So it, it was really a fascinating uh, period looking at that that whole thing. And again, looking at it from uh, the perspective of uh information that's come out since that whole time. There was a lot of news that came out at the time, but all this this detail involving Rafi Eitan and so forth didn't come out until much later. So I was able to incorporate it into this uh, larger uh, dynamic of the book. Yeah, it, it, Jim, it was fascinating for me having been involved in it 38 years ago, but not, I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole other chapter or series of chapters that developed after this, which you give like I said, floor detail to, and just it's contextually, it's, it's riveting for me. It also gives rise to, and please accept the compliment here, but there's on the fictional, on the fictional side of intelligence journalism or intelligence writing, there, there's a first among equals as you are on the nonfiction, on the SIGINT side, on the, on the fictional side, there is for those of us on the human and certainly on the CI side, uh, at the top of his craft is, is Graham Greene. And so I noticed with, with, I mean, with some real, with some real energy for me that Pollard was a Graham Greene aficionado and, and had a thing for the quiet American. But additionally, you bring us in contact with the South African element in the earlier chapters in your book, especially with regard to Benjamin Bloomberg and you introduce Hendrik uh, Vandenberg, the boss representative, so the Bureau of State Security for the South Africans, which, of course, is one of the central themes to the human factor by Graham Greene. So I was wondering if you were aware of of this fabulous fictional thread that runs through some of your non-fictional characters with your research and in your book. Yeah, it's a very good question, John. I really appreciate it because I, I've always been a huge fan of Graham Greene. I've uh, read uh, uh, Human Factor, uh, uh, you know, I think several times actually, and uh, it did. Uh, I did think of it as I was writing about the um, uh, events in in South Africa involving uh, Bloomberg and Milchan and so forth. Uh, uh, because uh, you know, as the title implies in in uh, Graham Br Graham Greene's uh, book, uh, the human factor, uh, that's what's missing a lot in uh, uh, movies, James Bond movies, and so forth, where the focus is on action and uh, sexy people and and all, and all that. But uh, Graham Graham Greene basically focused on the the human element of. Uh, or the human factor of espionage and what goes through a person's mind and the doubts and 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 how somebody eventually becomes a spy and 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 all that and that was really, was really fascinating about the uh, uh, the human factor and uh, another one was uh, that I really liked was uh, Stamble Express it later became titled um, Orient Express but. Uh, Again, it's it's his character development and and scene development that I really liked in Graham Greene's writing, and the writing I do. Um, I've started out uh, as a writer a long time ago, so I, I'd never worked for a newspaper. Um, I've always been a book writer or a magazine writer or else a television producer. So I've always had a uh, uh, 
uh, had to think about things visually, um, not just uh, this happened this day, this happened that day, and fact after fact after fact. That's how newspaper articles are written. So I've had to think in terms of visually and 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 uh, reading books like Graham Greene's book um, was very helpful in terms of me constructing uh, the book in such a way that it reads almost like a novel in terms of the structure and in terms of the character development and the um, the color. Um, you know, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time actually going out and finding color. So instead of saying, you know, they had a meeting in this hospital room, um, I, I did a lot of research to find out what the hospital looked like and what the room looked like and what was the color of the walls or whatever. So you can, so I could actually write that uh, uh, with a, a degree of color, uh, but again, and I enjoy that uh, looking into the details and how how things look, not just a past secrets to be, but how everything behind it, what was going through people's minds, wh what the room was like when they passed it, and and all that. So I've always tried to incorporate those kind of details in my books. Again, for our viewership and our listenership, let me let me reinforce that for you. If you haven't read the book yet, you need to pick it up and you'll almost immediately be confronted with, as I said, to start off, the contextualization of this is, is almost in the first person. The, your, your scene description is it, it almost has a first person quality to it in terms of, as you said, colors. And the spatial relationships among, you know, set pieces within your scene is just it's 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 breathtaking. So all credit to you, not just for being a, a factually informative, compelling book, but and I don't want to say entertaining in, in the cheapened sense, but in the, but in the engrossing sense, the, the, the context, color, the vivid detail you provide is just it, it, it helped it helped set, set it in three dimensions. So it just it was fascinating um, coming from somebody with a great background like yours. You know, an entire career looking at spies, chasing spies, catching spies, uh, and I've always been an outsider looking in. Uh, that's a great compliment. I really appreciate it, John. Thank you. Of, of course. Uh, before we leave this part, Jim, and, and we've discussed doing this in two parts, so we can get into some of the chapter by chapter descriptions in your book. I want to go back to a point you had made earlier when you talked about the diversion at Apollo at New Mech. So as you point out clearly in the book, this has been a source of some considerable consternation, if not outright conflict within the U.S. national security community and within the U.S. intelligence community. So in fact, if we can revisit that for just a moment, the fact of a diversion at all or how much of diversion was then and remains to this day somewhat of a disputed event within the formal or official U.S. intelligence community. Would I be correct in, in characterizing it that way? Yeah, there's always been uh, uh, a question because nobody was ever arrested. And uh, uh, But if you do a lot of research, as I did, uh, you, you find out that everybody involved was, was basically convinced that uh, this was taking place from the director of the CIA to the director of the FBI to uh, uh, to a representative that uh, President Jimmy Carter sent to look into it, and she came back saying, "Yeah, yeah, I believe that this is uh, this is happening." But when it got up to Carter and, and presidents before him, um, it was always, uh, uh, you know, put the file back in the drawer and shut the drawer uh, because Israel is a is a topic that uh, no politician wants to deal with. I mean, in writing this book, I decided that Israel is just another country. I'm not going to give it any more privilege than any other country. I treat it just like uh, I would any other country. Right. They send spies. I'm not going to hide anything. I'm going to write about their spies. I'm going to write about who is spying for them. Uh, I don't give Israel any uh, leeway whatsoever in the book, uh, which may bring a lot of people angry at me, but that's what I do for a living. You know, so I wrote a lot about uh, Numic. Uh, there's people there that are sick because of the uh, uh, nuclear materials that were buried in the ground after Numic, uh, well, while Numic was there, they were burying a lot of the plutonium and other radioactive materials in the, um, in the ground, uh, very uh, not far underground, not far enough to keep it safe. So 
a, a few years ago, uh, it was discovered it was discovered that that was a, a, a very dangerous dump. The whole place in Apollo where where uh, the plant was and the uh, uh, um, Homeland Security had to build a huge fence around it and put armed guards around it so nobody would go on to the property. And then there were a lot of lawsuits that came out because people got sick. There were people that died uh, from radioactivity. Uh, yet nobody ever was prosecuted for any of this activity. And so those are the kind of things that uh, uh, somebody like me um, feels obligated to to write about because uh, nothing was done on the uh, uh, you know, on the prosecution side. Right. And so just, and just going back to, to that period of time, the allegation made both by the Bureau and the CIA was the diversion. So again, Numic is a privately owned non-U.S. governmental uh, uranium refiner and producer for an energy purpose. And the allegation is that in the loss of couple hundred kilograms of refined uranium, and then in some cases, plutonium, that the diversion actually wasn't by accident or mistake, but it was a purposeful diversion at the behest of Israeli intelligence working through a man by the name of Zalman, and you'll have to help me here, uh, Jim, Shapiro. At right. New he, was, uh, he was the owner of the, uh, of the company, Numic, which stood for... Uh, some, it was an acronym for the name of the company, uh, Nuclear Materials uh, Processing Company, or something like that. But Numic was the company, and uh, and Shapiro was the uh, the head of it, and he's the one that uh, uh, was a subject of uh, the investigations. Right, right, and and I wanted to get back to him to close out this part of our our presentation for our viewership, um, because. You correctly point out in the book, and and now these materials are declassified. They were never, they were never non-classified or unclassified, but they've since been declassified. And you reference them in your book, and that is the fact of wiretaps on Zalman Shapiro, which are now declassified and available through a variety of U.S. governmental sources. I want to lean into that part of your resume that a lot of people, I suspect, don't know about, and that's the fact that you're a lawyer. So give, well, I have a law degree. I don't practice law. So. Well. Uh, so you have a law degree. And if I could ask you just to once once you came upon this, discover is probably too dramatic a term, but once you came upon this, knowing that the wiretaps the U.S. government was doing for a counterintelligence purpose prior to the passage of the FISA Act in 1978, were conducted under a different set of authorities. And if as a as a trained lawyer, let's say, not a practicing lawyer, but a, as a law school grad, what were your sentiments when you discovered the use of a wiretap without benefit of warrant or order for a counterintelligence or national security purpose? Or was that really a, a small sidebar to the overall story for you? Even though I don't practice law, I've been actually involved in, in numerous uh, legal cases involving espionage. So I've, I've worked uh for defense uh, defense firms and so forth, so I'm, I'm fairly knowledgeable about the uh, espionage laws and so forth. And that was a very interesting aspect when I was reading about that the the wiretaps that were being done on Shapiro. Uh, and uh, in Puzzle Palace, for example, I wrote a lot about the uh, formation of the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and the reasons for it. And, and so forth. Um, but um, and prior to the FISA court, there were the restrictions were far less on uh, getting uh, eavesdropping warrants and things like that. So um, it, with Shapiro's case, though, I don't think there would have been any if it was done uh, post FISA or while there was a uh, FISA court. I don't think there would have been any problem getting a FISA warrant to eavesdrop on Shapiro's communications. I mean, you had enormous amounts of evidence showing that uh, the company uh, that he was running was uh, shipping, illegally shipping highly enriched uranium to Israel. And you had meetings between uh, Shapiro and, and Israelis uh, in Israel. He would go over to Israel quite a bit and he'd meet the uh, people who were involved in nuclear activities in Israel. And uh, 
And then you had Rafi Eitan uh, um, and people from the Israeli intelligence uh, co- going to this little plant in uh, Apollo, Pennsylvania. So, I, you know, if you put all that in a uh, an affidavit and brought it before a FISA court judge, uh, I don't think there would have been any doubt that the judge would have issued a uh, FISA warrant uh, for FISA eavesdropping warrant on uh, on Shapiro's communications. Right. And of course, being inside as I was, I, I'd agree, but I think people would expect me to agree. So I so I appreciate your at a distance objective observation with regard to that. Jim, let me do this. Uh, as we discussed earlier, we'd like to do this in two parts. Uh, we don't want to tire you or me out, frankly. Um, but I'd like to conclude here, part one, and set up part two with the following. Uh, Arna Milchan is somebody that stays on the front page of many newspapers around the world, even to this day, as you know, he's still alive and he's still making news, whether he likes it or not. Uh, But I notice in your book, which in addition to being, as I said, floridly descriptive and, and, and captivating, is also, as is all your books, extraordinarily well researched and footnoted. And in a number of your footnotes, you refer to a series of interviews that Milchan starts to give in 2013, which I found fascinating. And then it sent me to the internet looking up interviews he was doing on TV, interviews he was giving to the printed press in Israel and around the world. Why is it, if you have an opinion on this, why is he think in 2013, all of a sudden Milchan starts to speak pretty openly about his past involvement with Israeli intelligence and his involvement in these operations? I just, I found... When first alerted to it in your book, I found it fascinating. And then as I dug deeper based on the references contained in the back of your book, it became more interesting to me. And I was just wondering if you, for me personally and and for our viewership, have an idea as to what's going on in his life that in 2013 he starts starts to speak so openly about this. Yeah, it's a good uh, that you picked up on that because I thought it was very fascinating also having followed Milchan's career from the mid 60s. Um, so uh, Milchan uh, has an enormous ego. I mean, he's he uh, um, he's just a, a guy that uh, has a big ego. Uh, the problem is one of the things he never talked about uh, or never talks about was his uh, involvement with uh, espionage, his involvement as a member of Lockham, a nuclear spy for Israel in the United States. And in addition to running a front company, he also attempted and, and apparently succeeded in, in recruiting a number of uh, Americans uh, in, in uh, the film industry to um, work for him uh, as, as sub-agents. Uh, he basically admits that. So he hadn't really said anything about his uh, intelligence background. People would, would ask him about it, and he would sort of make a uh, exaggerated expression, like he doesn't know what they're talking about, and sort of wink. I mean, it was like, well, it's probably true, but I can't talk about it, that kind of an attitude. Um, so he had this sort of inner spy in him that wanted to get out, I think, uh, to tell the world that, you know, here's a guy that makes these James Bond movies. He uh, he actually did uh, the movie Mr. and Mrs. Smith, for example. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, he decided to uh, accept an invitation from a uh, television program in Israel. It was a local program, uh, and the program was going to be in Hebrew. It's just a, not an internationally shown program. And uh, again, it was in Hebrew language. So so he felt like that would be a good opportunity to sort of let that inner buy out. And so he accepted it, and he, he did the interview with the Israeli uh, woman who was the uh, interviewee. And um, Robert De Niro was uh, was sitting next to him during the interview, uh, because De Niro goes way back uh, to the beginning with uh, Milch in terms of friendship, back to the um, 80s. So the interviewer uh, is asking Milchin about all his uh, experiences, and he basically admits uh, to being a arms dealer for apartheid South Africa and all these other things. And then they get into um, uh, his espionage, and uh, he basically admits it. Uh, uh, De Niro is sitting next to him, and De Niro says, uh, oh, yeah, he told me about that. Uh, I, I asked him about that years ago, and uh, 
and uh, he he was involved with these little things. And then Milchin says, Crytons. And then De Niro says, yeah, Crytons. And he says, yeah, I did it for my country and, and all that. And Milchin doesn't deny it or anything he's sitting there. And then afterwards, the inter interview, the woman who did the interview uh, expressed her surprise that Milchin, you know, finally basically admitted that uh, he had done these things. So the problem was he, he thought that nobody was going to see that in the U.S., but he flew back to the United States and apparently somebody at the State Department, somewhere in the bowels of the State Department, had caught wind of it or saw it. And Milton had been living in the United States uh, for a lot of his adult life uh, as a big Hollywood producer. And he would live here on, on, on a 10-year visa. And every 10 years, he'd get the visa renewed. Well, after he did that interview, uh, somebody at the State Department canceled his 10-year visa. And Milton became panicky, uh, not only because, uh, you know, this is where he'd been living all his life and this is where he made his money as a Hollywood producer. But if they cancel his, his uh, visa, you know, maybe the FBI is after him now. So he got very nervous and he, um, he called up Netanyahu, who was one of his old friends, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of uh, Israel, and said, you got to help me. Uh, you know, uh, you got to help me get my visa back, my 10-year visa. And uh, so Netanyahu went to the uh, U.S. ambassador in Israel and, and uh, got uh, uh, him to agree. But all he could do is do one year. In order to get 10 years, he needed to get that directly from uh, the Secretary of State, John Kerry. So M Milchin then gets uh, uh, Netanyahu... Uh, Netanyahu agrees to put a meeting together between Milchin and, and uh, Kerry. And eventually Milchin uh, gets his 10-year visa back, I, I, I guess. That's what, it, that's what it appeared to be. <clears throat> so after that, Milchin's happy. He's got his visa back. But Netanyahu doesn't think this is all over at this point. He wants a little payoff. So he starts asking for these, basically, what they are, bribes. And so Milchin then starts giving him all these uh, expensive gifts and bribes, and uh, it turns out to be several hundred thousand dollars worth uh, of of these uh, bottles of pink uh, cases of pink champagne, expensive cigars, uh, forty thousand dollar bracelets for his wife, and all these things. And for years, uh, Milchin thought that the FBI would never come after him in in the U.S. because they just don't go after people from Israel. Uh, Israel spies have a sort of a free card, you get out of jail free card in the U.S. At least uh, Israeli spies from Israel, uh, not uh, people like Pollard who happen to be Americans, but Israeli spies. So he didn't think that there'd ever be a knock on his door from the FBI, uh, which there wasn't. But then he goes back to Israel and all of a sudden the Israelis are after him and the Israelis are at, uh, the Israeli police are after him and the Israeli police are after Netanyahu because they heard of this, uh, this, these bribes taking place. So unlike the U.S., the Israeli police didn't have any problems going after either the prime minister or uh, uh, Milchin. So they either threatened, well, at one point they threatened Milchin that he was going to be under arrest. And he agreed to, so in return to have that dropped, he agreed to be a state's witness for the prosecution against uh, Netanyahu. And all this all these riots and everything that's taking place in Israel today largely have their have their origins with this because um, what happened was uh, Netanyahu was brought to court on these three serious charges and he lost office. He was uh, defeated in, in the election. And so he was out of office for about a year, but the trial is still going on. And then he wins re-election and the trial is still going on. So he's still facing these charges. He may end up in jail. And uh, and uh, one of the most serious charges is the one involving uh, Milton. So um, he's facing these charges. He's now prime minister. And so what he's trying to do is uh, rework the justice system so that basically the government will over have the ability to overrule judges and so forth, uh, especially the Supreme Court judges. And he's looking at it as that a, that's a way for he won't have to go to trial. He won't have to go to jail. They'll cancel the uh, uh, if he if he's able to accomplish this, they'll they'll um, cancel the trial. And so 
but that basically means uh, involves getting rid of the uh, a lot of the judicial system and uh, the independence of the Supreme Court. And that's why there's been all these riots in Israel now. They don't seem to care about the Palestinians, but uh, they certainly want a democratic government for themselves. So they've been uh, uh, rioting um, in Israel uh, over Netanyahu's changes to the uh, judiciary. So again, it, following this thread all the way through from Netanyahu in the mid uh, '60s all the way to the riots taking place today and in Israel, it's been really a, inter a fascinating uh, journey. And uh, really, I, I'm the only person that really sort of puts that whole framework together. Yeah, exactly right. And it's the reason I wanted to start off, at least with our first part here, by both going backwards into the mid 60s, more than 50 years, and then bring you current, because as you said, this continues to play out on the front pages of all the newspapers in Israel as the case remains current and the relationship between Netanyahu and Milchan has obviously taken a turn in, for Milchan's own personal self-interest. And with that... Mil it's Milchan, just to break in for a second, <laughs> uh, Milchan all of a sudden decided, I think just a few months ago, uh, to uh, change his uh, location from uh, Hollywood. He's now living in London. So uh, I don't know if he's worried about the FBI finally coming after him or uh, uh, the Israeli subpoena him or whatever, but um, uh, apparently he's now living full time in London. Right. A, a city with which he has a long history and probably for all things in his life, all the equities in his life right now is probably the safest place for him to be and gives them the most amount of flexibility. Exactly, yeah. And with that, Jim, I think this is an excellent opportunity to bring to a close part one, and it sets us up for part two when we'll discuss the the time frame you give your readership early on in the book, which is from 2016 to 2022, and not just the Israelis, but the Russians, the GRU units you call out with specificity. The four PLA or the four P, the fourth People's Liberation Army units that are responsible for cyber and SIGINT in China, and we'll pick up with that in, in part two. With my just my strongest, most heartfelt appreciation for sitting down with us and discussing these matters. Which, like I said, for those that have read the book, I'm not telling you anything new. It it has a borrowing on a Hollywood theme, it has a cinema, cinema, cinemascopic scope to the book. It's just, it's, it's all encompassing, extraordinary. And for those of you that have not yet read the book, pick it up because in the breadth and the depth of the material and the subject covered, it's just, it's, it's captivating. So with that, Jim, thank you very much. And uh, we'll pick up again here in just a bit. And thank well, you, all. John. You know, I appreciate your great questions because you don't ask superficial questions. You ask questions that are very in depth in terms of their uh, base of knowledge and your experience and so forth. So, uh, yeah, it's a great experience being interviewed by you. And I appreciate Jim having me on his uh, his program here because it's a uh, program that goes out to all these people that I've uh, been associated with uh, as an outsider and admired for for many years for the work they've done in the uh, intelligence community. So again, thanks to both Jim and John, and looking forward to coming back for the for session two. Well, it was fascinating to hear these two bona fide experts share different but complementary perspectives on um, some really interesting counterintelligence and counterespionage history. Best news is that there's more to come. I want to thank John Kutraki and Jim Bamford for a very, very interesting first session. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks so much. Jim Hughes, thank you very much. <laughs>